Lupe Velez was a Hollywood star and she was a huge name in the 1930s. And particularly, she was one of the first American Mexican film stars. She had just filmed a huge series. It was called Mexican Spitfire. It was like a three or four part saga. She had done a lot of modeling. Everybody knew who she was. And yet in her 30s, she was found dead of an apparent suicide in her huge Beverly Hills mansion. On the hours previous to her death, Lupe went on a shopping spree and then prepared a spicy Mexican dinner. Then she went to her bedroom, filled with ceramic saints, flowers, and rosaries. She lit candles all over the bedroom. She did her makeup perfectly and put on her best silk pajamas. Then she proceeded to take a deadly amount of sleeping pills. She lied on her bed and waited for death to catch her in her dreams. While waiting for the final hours of rest, with the saints and their shadows as the only witnesses, Lupe, who probably was thinking about how beautiful she will look when people find her, suddenly had a horrible stomach ache because the pills mixed with the enchilada dish she just had. She got up and ran to the bathroom, a trail of vomit leading behind her. Suddenly, she was unable to walk properly and she stumbled in the bathroom, hit her head on the toilet, and drowned to death in the toilet water. Wait, actually none of that is true completely false. In this episode, I'm going to dissect the truth and tell you what really happened in Lupe's passing, dissect this urban myth and figure out where it even came from, and also celebrate her life and tell you a little bit about who Lupe Velez truly was. Maria de Guadalupe Velez was born in San Luis de Posti, Mexico on July 18, 1908. She was the daughter of a military man named Jacobo Violabos Reyes and Josefina Velez, an opera singer. Lupe was raised in a bourgeois family that suffered an economic decline after the Mexican Revolution. Velez's father joined the fight and according to her, often took his daughter on dangerous outings. Lupe herself talked about all the time that she did not have a normal childhood. Lupe had seen people fight to get shot and die before. And she talked about this a lot. She talked about how it's something that really left an imprint on her psyche. She said, when your American kids go to kindergarten, I am riding with my father in the Mexican army. I see the horse of my brother shot beneath him. I see many men try to kill my father. I see my father kill other people. It is my first school, the revolution. I do not cry. I do not have goosebumps on my flesh. I do not have fears of the bullets. According to Velez's biographer, Michelle Vogel, besides being traumatized by the violence she witnessed during the revolution, from a very early age, Velez has a naturally stormy personality. She was emotionally unstable, one minute being hilarious and charismatic, and then dramatically changing to a depressive or vicious mood. As she entered her teenage years, her family sent her to a convent school in San Antonio, Texas. There, she continued to be rebellious, spending hours writing, I must be good, over and over as punishment for her latest mischief. After a while in the convent, Lupe was called home. Her family was going through a crisis. Her father had been presumed dead in the war and their wealth significantly decreased. While most of her family members were too proud to get jobs, a teenage Velez did just that, supporting her family by working as a saleswoman in a department store. So Lupe, at a very, very young age, decided to become a performer to help her parents and her family pay for their lives. Soon Lupe was performing to sold out crowds in her city. Noche, noche. It didn't take long for Hollywood to notice Velez. In 1927, The Gaucho was released. Her performance thrilled moviegoers, critics, and studios alike. As soon as the film industry switched from silent film to talkies, the studios started cast typing Lupe in very stereotypical racist roles. They tried to accentuate her Latina identity and impose roles on her where she had to speak in thick, broken English, among other things. That's Brent, ladies and gentlemen, who's won by the Mexican team, Cortez and Villanova. Mexican team, come on, Villanova! Come on, Cortez! Candele, metale, metale, andele! Yeah, I was afraid of that. Come on, Cortez! Now listen. In the press, she was pitted against Hollywood's only other female Mexican star, the quote, high class and elegant Dolores Del Rio. Despite Lupe's origins, she was painted as a poor commoner. One racist critic went so far as to say that Lupe Velez has no more dignity than a common street donkey. 
There were a lot of rumors about Lupe's love affairs and relationships, more so than almost anyone I've ever read about or seen from the 1920s and 30s. In particular, with Lupe Villez's romantic past and her temper, I can't tell from what I found what is real and what's fiction. So in the last few years of Lupe's life, she had this really hard juxtaposition to struggle with. Her career on screen was doing okay. She had just signed for the Mexican Spitfire uh, series of four films. It wasn't an A-list film, but she was still getting a check. She had a decent house. She had a decent name for herself in the media. She had a decent amount of money, but her love life and her mental health was not doing well. In November, 1944, Lupe herself announced to the press that she was engaged to Austrian actor Harold Ramon. So there was a catch to this love drama. It's that Lupe Velez was pregnant and she was a devout Catholic. Almost as soon as Lupe announced the engagement, it was called off because he refused to marry her. So at the time she was pregnant and Harold was allegedly the father of the baby. But there are other theories of who the father was. I've heard it floating around, but Lupe herself confirmed Harold was the father. So here's the official story of Lupe Velez's death. On December 13th, 1944, she had dinner with two friends. Her first friend left and then her other friend Estelle stayed with her until around 3.30 in the morning. Estelle later claimed that Lupe confessed to her that she was with child and she did not feel like carrying on or living life anymore. Estelle also claims that Lupe said the only thing she was getting scared of was life itself. So on the morning of December 14th, 1944, Beulah Kinder, who was Lupe Velez's friend and hired secretary, walked in on Lupe Velez's dead corpse. But she had her head on a blue satin pillow and she had her hair, her newly dyed blonde hair strewn about and she had her hands on her chest, the bottle of sleeping pills, a police officer who was the first on the scene also said that she looked like a living doll and she looked too small for her giant bed. Lupe's reason for taking her life along with the life of her womb was mainly because the baby's father, Harold, refused to marry her. She felt absolutely betrayed and alone in a mess that was going against her religious beliefs and could potentially ruin her entire career. Everything I've read says that there were two suicide notes that Lupe left tucked in between her gorgeous satin blue pillow. One was to Harold Ramond and the other was to Beulah Kinder, her secretary and friend. One of the letters said, May God forgive you and forgive me too, but I prefer to take my life away and my babies before I bring him shame or kill him. How could you, Harold, fake such a great love for me and our baby when at all the time you didn't want us? I see no other way out for me, so goodbye and good luck to you. Love, Lupe. The other letter was addressed to Beulah Kinder and it said, My dear friend, you and only you know the facts for the reason I am taking my life. May God forgive me and not think bad of me. Take care of your mother, so goodbye and try to forgive me. Goodbye to all my friends and the American press that were always very nice to me. It was a clear scene, very clear motive, but that did not stop sensationalist journalists to come up with their own version of Lupe's death to fit the racist narrative that they had built up since the early days of her career. So first, right after the suicide, journalists jumped into Lupe's reason and judged her for not wanting to be a single mother. Which is a bit ridiculous because Beulah Kinder said that her and Lupe were talking and Lupe even suggested moving back to Mexico, having the child, coming back to America and adopting her child. There were newspaper headlines that even said stuff like, Lupe Velez, a suicide to avoid motherhood, with the subtitle, Actress Leaves Pathetic Notes. She said that Lupe told her she was going to go to Mexico to hide from the public and have the baby and then come back with it and claim it was adopted. And honestly, that was really common in old Hollywood. That wasn't a crazy plan. So the plan got mixed up when essentially Lupe felt that her lover was faking his love. So that's kind of what sent her over the edge, according to Bueller. Lupe was raised under Catholicism and to make it worse, under a more dictatorial, patriarchal society where marriage was very valued. This social context, plus her undiagnosed bipolar disorder, and then another recent heartbreak, 
really created the perfect scenario for her mental deterioration that unfortunately led to her suicide. Okay, so if this is the official story, you might be asking, where's the whole toilet thing coming in? Okay, so in 1959, 15 years later, Lupe's death was once again used for profit, and this time by the writer Kenneth Anger for his book called Hollywood Babylon. So the Hollywood Babylon series is like a serialized, really like lucrative commercial project that Kenneth Anger did to help finance his much less lucrative filmmaking career. It's also important to clarify that Kenneth Anger himself would joke and say that his claim to understanding all of these insider facts was his mental telepathy. Even Kenneth himself never said like this is 100% fact. So what he did was completely rewrite Lupe's ending. Kenneth Anger wrote, The bed was empty, the aroma of scented candles, the fragrance of roses almost, but not quite masked, the stench of recalling that was left by Skid Row derelicts. Juanita traced the vomit trail from the bed, followed the spotty track over to the orchard tiled bathroom. There, she found her mistress, Senorita, that is. Her head jammed down the toilet bowl, drowned. So it is relevant to say that all toilet searches are definitely connected to the Hollywood Babylon books. And then Andy Warhol did a film with Edie Sedgwick, where Edie was loosely playing Lu Lupe Velez. But they were both like, like basically Edie Sedgwick was supposed to represent like a giant, like old film star. And it was like loosely based off Lupe and someone who dies what they want to believe is tragically gorgeous, like Romeo and Juliet, but ends on a flat note. In The Simpsons, John Waters guest starred, and in the episode Homer's Phobia, he made a direct reference to Lupe Velez. Ooh. And there's where Lupe Velez bought the toilet she drowned in. Ooh. Another interesting pop culture expression is that there, the Simpsons are driving in the car and they're pointing at different Hollywood sites and they're ooing and aahing and taking photos, right? Well, this happened to Lupe's house. And what's really sad is her house became where people would gawk at in the 80s and 90s. It, would, it was basically a place where people would drive by and be like, there's a girl that died in her bathroom in her toilet, completely ignoring everything about her life on camera and off camera. And then, the 90s sitcom Frasier talked about Lupe Velez in their pilot episode. Ever heard of Lupe Velez? Who? Lupe Velez, the movie star in the 30s. Well, her career hit the skids, so she decided she'd make one final stab at immortality. They went on to talk about the spicy Mexican food and Juanita and the whole racist thing, and it was a punchline. I mean, it's kind of gross to watch it because you just like, after knowing the truth about Lupe and her story, it's really cringy to just hear this laughing track sitcom placed over with these punchlines about her real life. It's also important to note that the theory surrounding her death was not only because people liked morbid things and racism, but also because there were no known photos of the police scene. So because of that, there was no way to prove Lupe was found dead on her bed. So this was a huge place for other opportunists to distribute fake police photos surrounding her death. I can't show it on YouTube because of copyright issues, but there was this like you like this Hollywood brand that basically tried to say they had somehow gotten the original crime scene photos of Lupe's death. So you had to buy their book to see it. And I've seen those photos, you can Google it. And it's a woman laying on the ground who looks kind of like Lupe and she has like similar hair and styled clothes, but it's just, it's not Lupe. So the idea that Lupe Velez took her own life and died in this like serene, insane, Catholic imagery saint staring at her crucifixes, vomited from Mexican food, drowned in her toilet, it's sensationalism. I have seen pictures of her bedroom and there was not Catholic imagery like that. So concluding with this episode, we can say no, Lupe Velez did not drown to death with toilet water or break her neck or die in her bathroom at all. She was the victim of a judgmental society with an undiagnosed mental illness. She deserves the same respect any other person gets when it comes to their death, regardless of what their death was. She was a person with feelings and a life that was cut far too short.
If you'd like to hear more about her or even hear about the Dolores Del Rio versus Lupe Velez feud, let me know in the comments below and I will definitely make another video about that. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below so I can keep making more videos. Leaky Maka and Killarney, yes! We literally are the Bing Crosby Christmas classics!